You may or may not have heard about this serial killer before, and if you haven't, you're in for a shock because Jane Toppin is one of the most prolific and batshit crazy serial killers the world has ever seen. She killed 31 people between 1880 and 1901 as a nurse. What is so frightening about her is she was trusted to bring people back to good health, but instead she used her power to put them to death. She played God and eventually it caught up with her, but not after she had already left the path of murder and destruction. This is the tale of Jane Toppin, the killer nurse. Jane was born in Boston with the name Honora Kelly in 1897. She was the daughter of Irish immigrants. Her mother died of tuberculosis when Honora was only young, and her father took care of her and her siblings from that point onwards. He was not a mentally stable man and is said to have once sewn his eyes shut whilst working as a tailor. Eventually in 1963, the kids were placed into an orphanage called the Boston Female Asylum. Jane was only six years old. At the age of 10, Honora was adopted by Mrs. Anne C. Toppin, where she worked as an indentured servant. It's here she received the name Jane Toppin. Her life in this family was far from living in luxury, but she did fare much better than her siblings. One became an alcoholic prostitute, and the other ended up in an insane asylum. Jane, on the other hand, had a stable family and a roof over her head. However, Anne Toppin always made Jane remember her place as an indentured servant. Her foster sister Elizabeth, who was the daughter of Anne, was treated far better than Jane, although the two got along well. Jane attended Lowell High School, where she developed a reputation as a compulsive liar, a trait that would stay with her for the rest of her life. She often told others that her brother received honours at Gettysburg by Abraham Lincoln, and that her father navigated the globe on a sailboat. Neither was true, but she reveled in her lies. Jane graduated from Lowell High School at age 18. She was subsequently freed from her role as an indentured servant, but continued to work for the Toppins for many years until she finally decided to move out and pursue a new career. She enrolled for training as a nurse at Cambridge Hospital when she was 33. During her time here, Jane thrived in her new life. Nicknamed Jolly Jane, she was a favourite of doctors and patients, not only for her skill as a nurse, but her joyous nature towards her patients. They felt calm in her presence and enjoyed her company. However, her fellow nurses did not feel the same way. Jane continued to be a pathological liar. On two occasions, she spread rumours about other nurses that ultimately led to their expulsion from Cambridge Hospital. Jane was openly gleeful about their removal and her colleagues were not impressed. It was her time at Cambridge that saw her more violent and malicious tendencies come to the fore. Jane began experimenting with different drugs on patients. She was fascinated by the effect they had on people, especially when they showed pain. Amelia Finney was a patient of Jane Toppin at Cambridge Hospital. One night in 1887, as she lay ill in pain in her hospital bed, she was visited by Jane. Jane told Amelia that she had made a concoction that would alleviate her pain. The concoction was a mix of morphine and atropine, and it certainly did the trick. Amelia felt the pain start to disappear as her body became numb. Jane stood over her, watching tentatively as Amelia came close to a state of unconsciousness. Then, as a loving parent would do with their child, Jane hopped into the hospital bed and held her tightly. Unable to move, Miss Finney had to endure the unconsented advances of Jane as she kissed her forehead and held her even tighter. Jane then offered Miss Finney another glass of the body-numbing concoction, but before she could give it to her, fled the room as a noise was heard in the corridor. Amelia woke up the next morning, startled and understandably shook up, but passed it off as a dream. There was no way something like that would happen in reality. Right? Jane took a particular disliking to older patients. She would often say that they were a waste of time and effort and their lives should not be prolonged. Her early experiments with morphine and atropine were mainly conducted on older people. Although she was open about her disdain, no one took the remarks literally and played it off as Jane being her usual self. Little did they know, she was telling the absolute truth. Eventually, Jane's reputation as a nurse landed her a job at the prestigious Massachusetts General Hospital. Her relationship with drugs and other poisons grew from a fascination to an obsessive habit. 
The skills she possessed as a nurse began to wane as she became more and more lax every day. She would hand out doses of opiates to anyone that wanted it and continued to poison patients both fatally and non-fatally. She would often use this as a tool to boost her reputation by poisoning patients to the brink of death before nursing them back to health. Morphine would increase pupil size and atropine would decrease it. Jane was obsessed with this reaction in her patients and it both fueled and satisfied her bizarre needs. Jane's administering of opiates and an increasing habit of petty theft saw her dismissed from Massachusetts General Hospital soon after her employment. Although she was still highly regarded as a brilliant nurse by doctors, her poor behaviour was enough for termination. Little did anyone know Petty stealing was far from her most sinister crimes. Shortly after, Jane returned to Cambridge to ascertain her nursing licence. It didn't last long as the doctor noticed patients had a tendency to die in her care. He put it down to incompetence rather than malice. Her sights were now set on private nursing. She would thrive in this role and begin a poisoning spree that was both calculated and precision, but erratic in her obsession. In 1895, Jane would poison her landlord, Israel Dunham, and then his wife two years later, because they were old and cranky. Her disdain for the elderly did not escape her. Four years after poisoning Israel Dunham, Jane would be enjoying a nice holiday at Buzzards Bay with her foster sister, Elizabeth Toppin. Although the two seemed to get along very well, and Elizabeth certainly thought this was the case, Jane fostered, no pun intended, a deep hatred for her. Elizabeth was the biological daughter of Anne C. Toppin and was always put before Jane. Jane subsequently felt she lived in the shadow of her foster sister and harboured these feelings from a young age. During a picnic one summer's day, Jane laced Elizabeth's corned beef sandwich with strychnine, a potent poison that requires only a small dosage for severe effects. Elizabeth ate the sandwich and Jane held her as she convulsed in pain, ultimately dying in Jane's arms. It is around this time that Jane's murders take on another level. Any prior killings had been conducted on patients Jane had very little connection with. Her actions were malicious and disgusting, but had a sort of disconnect from Jane's private life. Not that this is any justification. From this point onwards, we know that Jane's obsession with poisoning people is no longer confined to patients, but those she also had a long, deep relationship with. In 1900, Jane needed work. Her friend Myra was working at John's Theological School in Cambridge and Jane fancied that as her next job. So, she poisoned her friend and took it. She would later find out that Myra had planned on taking a sabbatical and had suggested Jane take her position. Perhaps this would be the only time Jane felt even a drop of remorse, although I do highly doubt it. Jane had been renting a small cottage in Bourne in 1901. The Davis family owned the cottage and were growing frustrated that Jane was not keeping up to date with her payments. They decided enough was enough and Mrs Davis visited Jane at her cottage. She was poisoned with a mixture of morphine and atropine Jane had put in a glass of water. Mrs Davis remained in Jane's care for a few days before Jane decided to poison her fatally. She moved in with Mrs Davis's husband, Alden Davis, as a carer as he was old and frail. Their two daughters would visit regularly and Jane saw an opportunity. She poisoned Genevieve, one of the daughters, with arsenic in an attempt to frame it as suicide. Jane made a conscious effort to avoid metallic poisons as they were easily identifiable. However, this situation provided her a new opportunity to branch off into a new form of poisoning, likely something she had wanted to try for a long time. That is, except for Captain Paul Gibbs, the father-in-law of Minnie Gibbs, who suspected something was astray. He felt Jane's actions in the months prior had been suspicious and suspected she had a role in the unfortunate deaths of the Davis family. Captain Paul Gibbs contacted his close friend and governor of Cuba, Leonard Wood, and encouraged him to look into the situation. Wood similarly believed that there was something askew and began to organise an investigation. After murdering the Davis family, Jane moved in with Elizabeth's husband, Oromel Brigham, whom Jane had been infatuated with for some time. Soon, she would poison Brigham's housekeeper, and Jane would fill this role, moving in permanently. Her attempts at winning over Brigham were unsuccessful, and she resorted to the thing she knew best, poisoning. Oromel fell severely sick, 
almost to the point of death, but Jane helped him recover miraculously. Little did he know, Jane was the cause of his sickness, and she hoped by nursing him back to health, she would win his love, but she was wrong. Oromel grew sick of Jane's constant pestering, and when she threatened to say she was pregnant with his baby, he threw her out. It would later be revealed that Jane had also been the cause of Oromel's sister's death. Distraught by her rejection, Jane attempted suicide, but was admitted to hospital and slowly recovered. Many think that she didn't actually attempt to kill herself and only intended to cause herself harm. This is because her chosen method was that of poisoning, and if anyone knew what a fatal amount would be, it was Jane Toppin. Jane had only spent a few months out of hospital when she was arrested on October 29, 1901. She had pushed the limits too far with her murder of the Davis family, and her actions had finally caught up with her. She confessed to her lawyer that she had killed at least 31 people, but the figure was probably closer to 100. The newspaper at the time had an absolute frenzy with this case. Jane Toppin was unlike anything they had ever seen before, not just due to the sheer number of murders, but the way in which she recounted them. Jane was examined by three doctors prior to her trial, and their findings were cold and horrifying. This was featured in the St. Paul Globe on July 6, 1902. The lawyer said, Miss Toppin, you must be insane. Insane, she replied, how can I be insane? When I killed those people, I knew what I was doing was wrong. I was perfectly conscious that what I was doing was not right. I never at any time failed to realise what I was doing. Now, how can a person be insane who realises what she is doing and who is conscious of the fact that she isn't doing right? Insanity is the complete lack of any feeling of responsibility, isn't it? To which the lawyer replied, yes, but you have no remorse, have you? No, I have absolutely no remorse. I have never felt sorry for what I have done. Even when I poisoned my dearest friends, as the Davises were, I did not feel any regret afterwards. I do not feel any remorse now. I have thought it all over and I cannot detect the slightest bit of sorrow over what I have done. This paragraph in itself reveals the twisted and sadistic mind of Jane Toppin. One thing no one could understand was her motive. At the time, female murderers were often those that would gain in some sort of way from the death of the person they kill. Jane did it for the sexual arousement and the satisfaction she felt. When questioned about this by the doctors, Jane replied, No voice has as much melody in it as the one crying for life. No eyes as bright as those about to become fixed and glassy. No face so beautiful as the one pulseless and cold. 14 years after a traumatizing experience, Amelia Finney would realize her experience was not a dream, but a frightening reality. Jane was found not guilty by reason of insanity after the jury deliberated for only 27 minutes. She was sent to Taunton State Hospital where she lived out her remaining days. At the asylum, Jane slowly spiraled out of control. It got to the stage where Jane had to be force fed because she refused to eat out of paranoia. Her food had been poisoned. She died on August 17, 1938. 